in the beginning was the word. The problem was to get the word around. There was the penny post, the telephone, the biro, that was a breakthrough, radio, television, and now we have the internet. Okay, so I'm here to introduce you to the great global information superhighway, the internet. And in fact, all you need to become part of the global information superhighway is your computer, modem, connection to a telephone line, and an account with a mysterious body called an internet service provider. I suppose the basic question that most people ask when they start talking about the internet is, first of all, what is it? Well, it's a system whereby your computer can be connected to hundreds of millions of other computers around the world. Well, the next question is, why on earth would you want to do that? Well, for one thing, you can send mail anywhere in the world at just about the speed of light, and you can do it for the cost of a local phone call, so it's both faster and cheaper than what um, we net junkies call snail mail. But also, there is a tremendous amount of information out there on computers in countries, not only in Australia, but, as I said, all around the world. And uh, what you might want to use the net for is to access that information, which is in the form of words, pictures, sounds, video clips. It is a tremendous library. But as one person has said, it's like going into an enormous library where all of the books have been piled up on the floor and you've got no idea where to look for the particular information that you want. And that's where we will start. I'll tell you the story of looking for information about frogs. Now, what I'm going to do is to show you one of the most exciting applications on the internet, and that's a system called the World Wide Web, or the Web sometimes it's called. Now this is a system which is based on a piece of software called a web browser and the browser is like your window onto the contents of the remote computers. Now the problem that you have immediately as I said is amongst that great pile of books scattered on the floor how do you find the piece of information that you want? Some clever people have devised things called search engines. There are a number of these, but there is one which is specifically devoted to Australian web sites, as they're called. And this is a, a web search engine called the Little Web Wombat. Now, there's still no point in typing in the word frog, because I'll probably get thousands or perhaps even hundreds of thousands of references to frogs even just in Australia. So I want to narrow it down. Now, on the basis of what I've read about frogs and the people that I've talked to, I know that there is one really interesting local frog called a pobblebonk. Now, what you can see here is the page for the web wombat. And the important space, as far as we're concerned, is this box into which you can enter the word for which you want to search. Now, I'm going to enter the word pobblebonk which is the name of a Victorian frog. And I click on search, and the little web wombat goes looking for any reference to the pobblebonk anywhere on an Australian site. And it brings up a new screen, and here it tells me that at the Box Hill College of TAFE, they do indeed have a reference on their computer to the pobblebonk. Now, here we come to the way the World Wide Web works. It's based on things called hypertext links. This line down here is called the hyperlink or the hot link. And if I click on this, it will automatically connect my computer to the computer at the Box Hill College of TAFE and we'll see what's there. Apparently, there's a picture of a pobblebonk. Now, here's the pobblebonk. Not a very handsome frog. As it says up the top of the page, if you click on one of these pictures, you can hear the frog croak. I'll turn the sound up. 
and we'll click on the frog. So you can see why it's called a pobble bonk. Now, these hypertext links are scattered all over the web pages and you can use them to take you anywhere. For instance, on one of the Box Hill TAFE pages, it says, for more information on frogs, go to, these are other interesting frog sites, they tell me, and there's a frog site called the Somewhat Amusing World of Frogs. Well, why not? Let's see what's funny about frogs. So here we are at Charles Sturt University in Albury, and Craig Latham, who's put his name here so that we know who has constructed this page, has written a page called The Somewhat Amusing World of Frogs. And there is a tremendous wealth of information here about how to catch your frog and how to look after your frog and uh, information about different types of frogs. Virtually all web pages have links to some other web page somewhere in the world. And Craig has made a whole page of froggy links. If you wish to find out more, jump to Froggy Page. And he says, this is the Froggy homepage to look at. That's irresistible. So I click on Froggy Page, and a connection is being made. Now, I happen to know that this connection is being made to a computer at Yale University in the United States. Now, look at the speed with which that's happened, that I've gone from Box Hill to Albury and now to Yale in the United States, and I've got this page called the Froggy Page. So here we have a page all about frogs, with a picture of a very handsome frog up here in the top left-hand corner, and it says if I want to see a bigger picture, the same picture only bigger, I can click on this, and I'll see a bigger frog. Now, you want to keep the picture of the frog? If you're using a PC and you're running Windows, you click on your right mouse button and you get a little drop-down menu here and it says save picture as. And if I click on, click on that, I can save this picture onto my own computer. Click on save and I now have a permanent copy of the picture of the frog. Now, there is a lot of information here on this froggy page. There are literary references you can actually download by clicking on one of these links. You can download your own copy of Wind in the Willows, even though Wind in the Willows is about a toad and not a frog. But down here, the person, Sandra Loosemore, because I can see her name at the bottom, who has compiled this page, has got a section called Other Froggy Stuff. Here's a link that says, Make an Origami Jumping Frog. We'd better have a look at that. There you are, the full instructions for making your own frog with diagrams on how to do it. Not everything on the web is free. Some things you have to subscribe to, for instance, Encyclopedia Britannica makes the entire text of the encyclopedia available online, but in order to access it, you have to subscribe. But even the subscription rate in this case is much, much less than you would pay to own the Encyclopedia Britannica on paper. And of course the other advantage of this is that once you have downloaded the article that you want from the encyclopedia, you can easily cut and paste it into any document that you're working on at the time. When you log on to the Britannica site, you see that you're invited with these hot links to uh, a number of things. You can get a free trial if you click on that link. You can subscribe to the Britannica online, you can read an essay about the American presidential elections, and there are a number of other things that you can do here by clicking on these links that will take you to other parts of the Encyclopedia Britannica site. There is one service which is offered by Encyclopedia Britannica that I use every month, and that's a thing called Britannica Lives. This is one of those who was born on this day sort of thing, and every week I do a little spot about a composer on one of the radio programs in Melbourne. And so I'm always looking to see which particular composers were born on this particular day. Now, for instance, if I wanted to know which composer or which musician was born on January the 7th, I can enter in here January, go to 7, 
click on show listing. So I look down and I see Jean-Pierre Rampal, the great French flautist. And if I look further down the list, looking for musicians or composers, there's the French composer Francis Poulenc. Speaking of encyclopedias, if you own Microsoft's Encarta encyclopedia on CD-ROM, you can update it every month from the Microsoft site on the World Wide Web. You just go to the Encarta page, you click on the file for this particular month, and it's downloaded, and there is a routine on the CD itself for incorporating the new information that you've downloaded into the Encarta encyclopedia. While I'm showing you some of the niftier features of the internet, one really clever site is Telstra's White Pages. If you go to the White Pages, you can actually search for a telephone number anywhere in Australia. But if you're looking for one in Sydney, if you're looking for a business telephone number in Sydney, they not only give you the number, they give you a little map showing where the business is. Once you're on the net, you need a web browser. You can get, there are two well-known web browsers, one called Microsoft Internet Explorer and the other called Netscape. The World Wide Web browser that I have here is Microsoft Internet Explorer, which is another wonderful program that you can get for absolutely nothing. The first thing that comes up on the World Wide Web browser is the home page of my internet service provider, Alexia. Have a look at the what makes up a browser. It's a bit like a word processor in that you've got drop-down menus across the top and then underneath that you have a row of special buttons that apply to your web browser. This one here will launch the mail and news reader. This one will make the font on the screen larger or smaller. If I click on this one, it will print the contents of the screen. If I click on this one, it will search the internet, it will launch a search engine it'll, and uh, I can type in any Thing that I want it to find. This button here called Home takes you back to this first page, what's called the Home page on your internet service provider. This one refreshes the screen. If there is, uh, for some reason, you want to load the screen again, you click on Refresh, and this particular one stops whatever is happening. If something is loading on the screen and you've got sick of it and you want to leave it, you click on Stop. This one takes you back to the previous page that you were looking at. The one button that I didn't mention as I went past is this one, Favourites. Favourites is where you put the addresses of sites that you're likely to want to visit again. And this can be done automatically because wherever you are, whatever page you're on, you just click on Add to Favourites and it will add it to this list of uh, or index of favourite sites. Now, you may want to know, how is it that these connections can be made so quickly around the world. How do they know what the address is? How do they know what the location is of the computer that I want to connect with? Well, I'll show you. It's all to do with this address, which is called a uniform or a universal resource locator. And it's always written in a certain form. This is a World Wide Web address. All World Wide Web addresses start with these letters, HTTP, that stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Then there's a colon and two forward slashes. Those things are an essential part of a World Wide Web address. The rest of it is unique to this particular site. Now in this case it starts www.worldwideweb.telstra, you know who Telstra is, dot com for commercial, dot au for Australia. Now this would be a good point to talk about email, electronic mail. This is a very useful function of the internet because it means that you can send letters with attachments, you can send pictures, sounds, 
little video clips, almost anything you can uh, attach to your email and you can send it anywhere in the world virtually instantaneously. I'm involved in developing civil engineering and mining engineering software. And the other day, at about 10, we were rung up by one of our important clients, had a problem with our pavement design software, and we set to work on fixing the problem straight away. And by about 12, we were able to email the client an update of the software. We also emailed that updated version of the software to all our other clients uh, that were on email. Everybody on the internet has a unique address. There will be nobody else. Once you've paid your subscription to an internet service provider, you will be provided with, and you'll also be able to, sh to select to a certain extent, your email address. And that will be yours and yours alone in the entire known universe. At first glance, email addresses look the same as worldwide web addresses, but don't be misled. They have a different pattern to them, and they're used purely for sending and receiving email. Email addresses have a logic to them. First is the name of the person to whom you're sending the email. This person is very lucky because he or she has been able to lay claim to the name Smith. The at then says this is Smith at and this group here is the internet service provider. So it's smith at alexia, the name of an internet service provider, dot net, which stands for network, dot au, which stands for Australia. Now imagine that we wanted to send an email to Sandra Loosemore, the charming person who created the Froggy page at Yale University. Now, as with most people who create web pages, Sandra has put her email address in the page itself, which means that all I have to do is click on her email address here, which is lucemoresandra at cs yale, yale university edu, and it's in the United States. And I click on new message, and we're going to send a message to Sandra. We'll put her address in here, and... Uh, for the subject, we'll say frogs. And then down here in the body of the message, we go Sandra. We don't bother to say dear in emails. Here is a picture of a bonk for your collection. Along with the bonk. Croke. Now I can attach the picture of the pobble bonk and the croak of the pobble bonk to this particular email and I can send it off to Sandra in Yale and she can add it to her froggy page. On the other hand, I might just want to send a letter to my daughter in Sydney or to my son in Fitzroy or to my friend Peter in San Diego and it's all done with email. Email is just wonderful for reluctant writers. They get a response immediately. Like within a minute, your letter can be sitting on the other side of the world and uh, the response can be back if the person's at the computer at the same time. The kids want to have things spelt correctly because that's a real person there. Now here's something really wonderful about email. If I want to send an email to a group of people, and I do in fact have a group of people with whom I regularly correspond called the Free Speech Committee. I click on that, click on OK, and here at the top of the form it says Free Speech Committee, but in fact that represents the email addresses of eight or nine people to whom I am going to send this email. And so then I click on send and off it goes. Sending email only costs you the cost of a local call plus the time that you spend connected to your internet service provider. So it's fast, it's cheap, it's convenient, it enables you to send frog croaks. You can't do that in snail mail. Hardly anyone who uses the internet uses every service it offers.
For instance, I've never used internet relay chat, or just chat as it's known to the net nerds. Chat gives you the possibility of talking to other people anywhere in the world and doing it for very little cost. When I first got into the internet, I'd spent quite a lot of time and I'd have some huge sessions. One, one time I finished at about six o'clock in the morning, <laughs> having gone for most of the night and just, it was because a, a continuous stream of people kept coming in and it was a group, a group thing, just people from from Vancouver to China and there was always someone to talk to. There are specific chat channels about different subjects, about um, bands or, or music or that sort of thing. And just also just ones called, you know, crazy chat or fun chat. Most chat is, um, is not censored but there are channels that will censor it and will kick off people. There are sort of bigger brothers who will kick off people who are using explicit or pornographic language or pictures. Hey, wait, look, yes, I know. If you haven't been on it, you don't understand because you think it's just full of computer nerds and... Um, but it's just normal people. Just... It's like a room where you can just go in and have conversations with lots of different types of people. It's not like everyone's staring at you or something when you come into a room. <laughs> Most people are around about 20 to 25, but a lot of people I get guess say they're older than they actually are because nobody can tell. You've got to be like careful who you give your um, email address out to because I've heard about things called email bombs or something. You can send like viruses on via email. You get to know people well, some people, because they come like to a, a chat room like regularly. It's a bird which is pinkish colour and like got grey wings. Gee, that sounds great. Do you have any eagles in Australia? Audio conferencing is interesting. Uh, we often have the students teach each other about slowing down their speech and making sure their words are very, very clear. Now look at the camera, guys. Not the, not the screen, the camera. <laughs> Lovely smile too. Video conferencing has been such a motivator because they can see for themselves studies that are similar to the ones they're doing here in Australia and can compare with other countries across the world. One of the things for the future is uh, the, that is certainly growing in popularity now is the online communities using what are called graphical avatars. Uh, and what that is, is rather than just using your words to represent yourself, you pick admittedly a small, poorly animated little sort of cartoon sprite, and that sprite will walk along the screen, and as you type words, they'll come out of like a speech bubble in that sprite's mouth. People will have a party in, in these online worlds, and a whole bunch of avatars will just turn up in a room and everyone will talk. I mean, the online community thing is fascinating, and, and certainly, I suppose, is the most advanced way of interacting with people on the internet at this stage, um, and it could go anywhere. There are some parts of the internet which are a real free-for-all where anything goes and one of those services on the internet are what's called news groups. There are in fact thousands and thousands of news groups dealing with all manner of topics. I mean have a look here, here's a news group which deals with architecture interior design, architecture alternative, architecture, here's one dealing with archaeology. I can go down here further and you'll find that there are news groups which are mainly pictures. It's in the news groups that internet users exchange their prejudices, their ignorant opinions, their interests.
for instance, there's even a news group here I see called Alt Binaries Pictures Vehicles. So if you're into pictures of vehicles, this is the place to look for them. And I've called it up here on the screen, and it appears that I can get a picture of a Jaguar. Sometimes you can spend a lot of time waiting for pictures to download. Pictures, of course, tend to be much bigger than text files, and uh, depending on the time of day or the day of the week, you may find that the internet is quite crowded and it takes a long time to get the information that you want. This picture of the Jaguar is only a small picture, but it's going to take quite a while for it to be transferred from the host file onto mine. So once the picture is transferred, it shows up on my system here. This is the name of the file, 66JAG1, JPG, meaning that it's a picture file. If I click on that once, it asks me, do I want to save it? And I say, yes, I want to save it. And it runs the picture viewer and shows me the picture of the E-Type Jag, which I've just downloaded from the United States. <laughs> I'm not much of a computer games player. This is a region of cyberspace full of weird and wonderful things so what I'll do is I'll leave you to go boldly adventuring with Steve Pollack. He's a reviewer of electronic games and he knows about these things. Well uh, this is Quake uh, which is currently one of the most popular 3D adventuring combat games. Um, that's sort of a, a very popular genre on the internet but not really the only sort of thing you can play with on the net and basically what you do is you're in a totally immersive 3D environment. You can look up, down, you can, you know, swim, you can do all sorts of cool stuff. And you can play the computer, which is what I'm doing. But you can also actually log on and play against other opponents. So, for example, this guy up here, rather than being computer controlled, could be a, a human controlled player. And then when you bring the, the multiplayer thing into it, and you actually get other people involved. See, I know that when I shoot that, a guy's going to appear there and I can run away. And it's sort of slightly predictable because I know where your opponents are going to arrive. But in a multiplayer mode, instead of that, I actually don't know what's going to happen, and so it makes the game more challenging. There are other sorts of games as well. Um, this is a multiplayer internet game which has really caught my imagination called Gene Wars. And as opposed to being a sort of conventional war game, this thing's different because you're actually starting at the end of a war and a whole bunch of uh, warring races and factions have been gathered together and have been told to basically tidy up the planets that they've devastated ecologically. And certainly the internet is a great venue for creative sort of mind expansion and, and creative problem solving because playing this against the computer, you know, I can pretty much beat the computer pretty solidly because I have a bunch of strategies and I know what the computer's going to do. But having had a bit of a crack at this against human opponents, you just got no idea. The Ethereals have arrived. From time to time you'll hear a person say that I got it off the net. And they're usually referring to a piece of software that they've downloaded from a library of software somewhere on the internet. For instance, most of the universities in Australia have these publicly accessible software libraries. Monash University has a very big one. And to access these software libraries, you use a thing called an FTP client. And that stands for File Transfer Protocol. And with that, you can connect your computer to, say, the Monash computer. You get into the public part of their records on that computer, and then you can look for the sort of software that you would find useful on your own computer. What's here that I might like? Well, there's a, a calculator there. It says that it's a scientific engineering, statistics, financial calculator, and so on. And if I double-click on that, and then say that I want to save it, that begins the process of transferring that particular piece of software from the Monash computer to my computer. So this is one way of acquiring very useful software without actually paying anything for it. When you get tired of reading about other people on the internet, you can put yourself on the internet. Here's my home page. 
picture of me and a description of me from the Monash Dictionary of Biography and some links to some information about some of my books. For instance, if I click on this one, it takes me to a page about my novel Hectic, picture of the cover of the novel and an extract from the first chapter. It's the ultimate in vanity publishing. Now, this isn't a terribly serious way of using the World Wide Web, but people with things to sell are finding that the web is a very good medium for letting people know what it is that they have to sell. About a year ago, I set up a home page for our company, and this consists of an overview of the company and also what I'd call brochures describing our various software products. And the response to this has been building up over the last year, and it's mainly from markets that we don't normally have much access to, uh, the US, Europe, South America, Africa. And uh, just recently we got an order from Brazil. Putting together the home page really isn't much harder than doing word processing. We've added graphics, uh, most of which we've either drawn on the computer or photographs which we've loaded up from a scanner. It cost us about $200. It's very easy to use and it has uh, very good resolution. I had some Simpsons files, like some sound files and picture files that I'd gotten off other people's home pages and some friends. So I thought I'd compile them to make a page which I named the Ultimate Simpsons page. So it took me about a day to make. For the first three weeks it was on, approximately 1,000 people came, visited, hits, and then it was disabled by my service provider because um, the service provider couldn't handle so many hits. I had some emails from some teenagers and a seven-year-old saying how good my site was and and I also found that there was a link to my page in Spain. As Noel Coward once said about television, television, darling, is not for watching, it's for being on. Well, the web's just like that. OK, so you want to get on the internet, what do you need? Well, first of all, you need a computer, obviously, and you need a modem. That's the device that connects your computer to the telephone lines. Then you need an internet service provider. Now, the internet service provider is a bit like uh, a telephone exchange, for instance, except that in the case of internet service providers, there are hundreds of them around the country competing for your business. How do you decide which internet service provider you're going to join with? Well, they have different ways of charging. Some charge an upfront fee plus an hourly connection fee. Some charge an annual fee and you get two hours a day without any extra payment. They have all manner of different ways of charging. And so what you have to do is you have to look at the service provider charges and you've got to think how much time am I likely to spend surfing the net and uh, you'll have to decide which is the most economical service for you. Then having chosen your service provider the next thing is to actually get connected and that can be quite tricky. In fact one of the best pieces of advice that you can have is to look around amongst your friends for somebody who is already on the net and they'll probably give you some advice about service providers and they will be able to help you get connected. Basically what you need is an up-to-date version of Windows or an up-to-date version of the Macintosh operating system and in that you will find the software that you need for actually getting connected to the net. Then once you've got your hardware up and running, you're connected to your internet service provider, then the world's your oyster. You're ready to go net surfing. If you ask most people what the internet is, I mean this is people who use it regularly, the first thing that they'll say to you is that it's fun. It's anarchic, you see nobody controls it. And because nobody controls it, a lot of the information on the internet is absolutely useless. 
And uh, I suppose in the end you would have to say that the greatest danger of the internet really is that you'll just simply spend too much time surfing, looking for something, goodness knows what, but somewhere out there on the great global information superhighway, who knows, there may be the meaning of life. I haven't discovered it yet, but I'm still looking. Thank you.